So, uh, good afternoon again. My name is Jirka Hlinka. I'm from Institute of Physics in Prague. <laughs> and I will be chairing this session. And it's my great pleasure to call the first speaker, which is uh, Dr. Kassorla, yeah. uh, from now from uh, uh, University Australia, and he's going to talk about multiple structural transitions driven by spin phonon couplings and multiferroic bismuth cobaltate. And I think it's invited to talk, so yeah. yeah, 30 minutes. Thank you. So thanks to the organizers for having invited me to talk about this talk have been done recently, along with uh, my collaborator Jorge Iniguez, working in the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. So here are my funding sources, which also I'd like to acknowledge. So <clears throat> as any of you should know, so uh, multiferroics are materials in which uh, two or more ferroic orders coexist. Normally these are ferromagnetism and ferroelectricity and which remain coupled to some extent. Right? So one very typical example of, of multiferroic material is bismuth ferrite. So this material, the ground state is a rhombohedral R3C uh, phase, in which we find out that the electrical polarization is orientated along the one one direction. And we have some out of phase uh, oxygen rotahedral uh, uh, rotations along the three pseudo cubic uh, axis, right? So the magnetic order in this case is antiferromagnetic order G, which basically means that the uh, atomic uh, magnetic moments are orientated anti parallel in any directions, both in plane or out of plane, right? So we know more or less know this. So this is uh, in bismuth ferrite, there is a competition between these. Uh, ferroelectric and magnetic phase, and uh, an orthorhombic non-polar phase, PVNM. So when you heat it up, this smooth ferrite at uh, ambient con pressure conditions, so at some point becomes paraelectric and adopts this phase, or if you just keep a constant temperature and you just compress it under pressure, also at some point it stabilizes on this non-polar phase, right? So, <clears throat> uh, the magnetic order in this case is also antiferromagnetic or the G, which is the same that we found in the uh, ground state. And uh, we find a, a bit different uh, pattern of oxygen uh, octahedral rotations, right? So multiferroic materials, in addition to, to this possible coupling between magnetism and ferroelectric, also possess some other very unique uh, um, properties, like can be electronic and structural properties. So in, 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 in particular, they are materials which can react quite a lot to external stimuli, and because of that, they are quite promising for different kind of applications, ranging from photovoltaic to information storage and energy storage and conversion too. Right. So because of this reactivity to external fields, magnetics or electric or even uh, stress fields, these uh, materials are also called multifunctional, right? And behind this multifunctionality, most of the time we find uh, phase transitions, right? So you do, you apply an external field and the system just changes from one phase to another, right? So I'm very much interested in multiferroics and in phase transitions in multiferroics, right? So because of that, a few years ago with Jorge Iniguez, we start wondering how important spin phonon coupling effects could be in multiferroic uh, compounds, in particular in multiferroic phase transitions. So what is this spin phonon coupling means? So as a matter of fact, when you consider different magnetic order in bismuth ferrite, your phonon uh, vibrations change, right? So this is a calculation based on DFT in which we calculated the phonon frequencies by constraining the magnetic moment to the ground state, which is antiferromagnetic or the G, or adopting the ferromagnetic uh, state in which all the magnetic moments are parallel, right? So by doing that, you can then identify one by one uh, Hagen vectors in the two states, and then calculate this uh, omega shift, right? That give you an idea of how important uh, spin phonon couplings can be. So as you can see, 
the spin phonon cappings, that how the phonon frequencies are changed when you consider different uh, magnetic code that is quite large, right? So we were thinking, OK, so if this is big, so this is calculated in the grand state uh, R3C, uh, rhombohedral phase. So how affect these effects to the phase transitions in bismuth ferrite, right? So <clears throat> for that, we developed an extension of the quasi-harmonic uh, approximation based on first principles calculations about which I will talk about uh, in more detail later, right? In order to get into account the effects of magnetic disorder on the phonon frequencies. In other words, so we know that when you heat it up, a magnetic uh, material, you know, the, the magnetic moments start to fluctuate, and that has an effect on the vibrational properties, right? So we wanted to take into consideration that particular temperature-induced magnetic disorder on the uh, vibrational frequencies of the material. So we did that, and we did, uh, so this is what is called here unfrozen spins, right? And at the same time, we just did quite a standard quasi-harmonic approximations in which we just uh, constrained the magnetic moment uh, of the atoms to the one that you see in the uh, ground state, right? So for our surprise, we found out that in reality, it didn't matter too much, at least for the rhombohedral, so the polar to paraelectric uh, phase transition, right, at normal ambient pressure conditions. So when you start heating it up, you know, at a temperature around 900 kelvins, you get the paraelectric phase. And we found out that actually the spin phonon couplings didn't have any effect really on that transition, right? So we were a bit disappointed, but then we start thinking, we start analyzing a bit in more detail, and we realized that in fact, if you don't look at the phase transition, you just look at the effect of the spin phonon couplings on each of the free energies of to the results. So by using this approach based on DFT, which allow us to take into consideration the effects of magnetic disorder as induced by temperature on the phonon frequencies, we came up with this phase diagram here, right? So basically these crosses and, and points are experimental data, and these uh, lines are our predictions. So we found out that in, if you consider zero pressure, so sorry, this is pressure and this is temperature. Yeah. So if at zero pressure, you know, with our approach, we could very much, well, quite, quite accurately, uh, predict the phase transitions at the points where experiments get it, right? So one important thing is that if you don't consider this approach in which you have into account the uh, effects of spin disorder, then you never get right these transitions as got in the experiments, right? So in principle, you get something, some transition temperature that is just uh, unphysically high. Also, uh, at the, on the zero temperature, but under pressure, you will get kind of good agreement with experiments. And then we find out a very exotic uh, region in our phase diagram that involves a double reentrant phase. So this is this uh, phase here, this region here, in which I, I put this is in yellow. So if we start from some point around 2.5, for instance, and we start heating up the system, so we start from some tetragonal polar phase with from anti fermented order, we then stabilize an orthorhombic non-polar phase, which is still anti ferromagnetic but after heating it up further, we got, again, a tetragonal polar phase. But in this case now, uh, paramagnetic, right? If we further heat up the system at some point, we get the paraelectric paramagnetic phase, right? So this is, I have to say that this is, hasn't really been uh, 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 seen in experiments, but we think because, you know, on the few works that has been done in this material, they have basically focused on, on finding the phase transitions and the high temperature range, right? But they haven't really uh, look into these details. In any case, we hope that these uh, results may motivate experimental uh, searches for these kind of effects that we are, we are presenting here. So <clears throat> the thing of having uh, the calculation of Gibbs free energy is something that is really nice because you can, you know, 
put uh, the contributions to your free energy uh, in separate parts and just look which terms are the really important, which, which are behind those phase transitions. And that's what we did. So first of all, we realized that any time the tetragonal or the orthorhombic phase became paramagnetic, it's a uh, Gibbs free energy start, you know, it suffer a change of, of a slope so that it became more energetically more favorable, right? So we look into the uh, free, handheld free energy and enthalpy contributions to the Gibbs free energy, and we realize <coughs> that the real effect, so the term in which the, was the, the, the bigger effect or was the responsible for these changes in the slope was on the uh, enthalpy uh, contribution, right? And the reason for that is because any time the system became paramagnetic, the volume of the system expanded, right? So that makes, what it makes is that the enthalpy, which has a pressure per volume term, just it, goes, it gets worse, right? And in the special case of the uh, non-polar phase, this is very extreme, so the system just gets uh, higher and higher in volume, right? <clears throat> so, sorry, this, is, this was just for the particular case of fixing the temperature to 2.5, so in this region of the phase diagram that we find out this uh, peculiar reentrant uh, phase, but we did the same for all the ranges that we study, and again, if for the, this is the uh, handheld free energy difference between the orthorhombic and the uh, tetragonal phases. So if this tense behaves quite monotonously, the enthalpy, uh, enthalpy contribution through this volume expansion when the system became paramagnetic in either of the two phases, it's the one that makes this, uh, is the final responsible for this um, series of phase transitions. So of course this is, uh, this phase diagram that we propose out of from our calculations is very interesting because you know you have quite uh, you know successive uh, multiferroic phase transitions, so we start wondering how could we bring back. So this happens at high pressure, but of course for practical purposes we would like to have this at ambient pressure, right? So we start looking in by two different uh, possibilities. One was solid solution, so by making doping, right? So essentially we start doing uh, some DFT calculations, monitoring the. Uh, enthalpy energy difference at zero pressure, right, between the P4MM and PNM phase, when we substitute it in the A and B positions, right, by similar elements. In particular, in the A position, we consider yttrium and also lanthanum, and in the B position, we consider uh, um, uh, manganese and iron, right? So we found out two possible uh, solid solutions which may may present, in principle, that nice, uh, that intriguing series of phase transitions at ambient pressure. And one of those is bismuth uh, lanthanum cobaltite and bismuth cobaltite ferrite, right? So this is at half and a half, and this is uh, just with a small amount of lanthanum. <clears throat> Another thing that we've seen also is, okay, so can we tune the energy difference between the polar and non-polar phase by means of a epitaxial strain? This is work in preparation, but our uh, answer is yes. So essentially, so here is the p 4 m and this is the PNMA. So when you go uh, down to tensile strains, that energy difference can be really tuned, right? So you see, uh, even at some point, you know, of course, the super trigonal phase is not energetically favorable anymore, even at zero temperature, right? The thing is that when you have, uh, in thin phase, we have found out that also another phase comes into play, which is a monoclinic phase. <clears throat> so, well, basically there are two, but uh, let's just say it's, it's one, which uh, have these properties, right, which have some uh, polarization that is not out of plane or in plane, so it has some direction, right, and it has also this pattern of oxygen rotahedrals. In this case, however, the CA radius is quite close to one. So here are uh, evolution of uh, the, the, the polarization in plane and out of plane, and also of the oxygen rotahedral. As you can see, the polarizations on the monoclinic PC phases and the POF OMM, it's quite large, right? So we did exactly the same as we did in the bulk case. So now 
We calculated the free Gibbs free energy for the different phases, the three different polymorphs that appears at zero temperature, and see how the, as you increase temperature and the magnetic moment and everything changes, how you know, the Gibbs free energy balance was changed. And we came up, we have come up actually with this phase diagram, which also seems to be very interesting. So in particular, we have this section here in which we can go from some uh, polar to non-polar to again polar. And even in this um, region here, even we also see some gamma of reentrant behavior, right? So we can actually uh, stabilize a polar phase by the effect of increasing temperature, which is quite uh, non-common. So again, if you don't take into consideration spin phonon cappings, you get a completely different phase diagram. So just uh, the last uh, few slides. So this region here is especially attractive for functional properties, basically because you stay in here, so this is kind of room temperature, you can, with an electric field, you can think of stabilizing a P4MM paramagnetic phase or a PC, so this monoclinic phase, uh, G uh, phase, right? And actually, so you can go from a phase to a high entropy phase or to a low entropy phase by applying an electric field with a particular orientation. So this presents quite high promising prospects for, for instance, for uh, cooling applications in which, by uh, based on the electrocalytic effect, so basically you can go from a phase to another phase which uh, involve a quite large change in entropy by applying an electric field. And because we actually have access to the free energy, we could really calculate that. So what we found out is that <clears throat> assuming that, we, we, that the P4MM can be established by applying an electric field out of plane, we came up with a kind of reasonable electric fields, not too big, so this is a critical electric field from going from here to here, kind of phase sort order of transition phase. And the impressive result as well is that the magnitude of the adiabatic temperature changes are very large, right? So with here fields of 200, you can get changes of 20 Kelvin at room temperature. And in this case, because you go from a low entropy to a high entropy phase, the change is indirect, uh, inverse, sorry. So you really are cooling down in moving from one to the other. However, now if you apply an electric field in a way that you stabilize the monoclinic PC phase, which has a lower entropy, you get some kind of like similar effect in terms of magnitude but now it's not indirect. Now it's direct because basically the entropy decreases so that the change of temperature increases. Right? So basically this has like quite uh, promising prospects for electrocalorie effects by uh, applying uh, electric fields and changing the orientation of it. So conclusions. So <clears throat> we believe we have shown that in multiferroic materials when the competitive phases present quite different structural and magnetic properties, then spin phonon couplings, couplings may be crucial in order to predict the phase transitions occurring in them. <clears throat> so as a, as a result of the effect of these spin phonon couplings, we can find very uh, impressive uh, functional phenomena, like for instance, this temperature driven reagent behavior and giant electrocalorie effects. And we believe that bismuth cobaltite is a good candidate in which to realize all these effects, well by doing solid solutions with iron or lanthanum, or well by growing up uh, film films. So thanks a lot for your help. The invited talk, uh, very nice results. So I think uh, the speaker deserves a short question, uh, at least. Uh, um, yeah, go okay. Microphone, please. Hello, um, thank you for the talk. Um, sort of as an added level of complexity, did you consider the possibility of spin state transitions? Um, of what, sorry? Of spin state transitions. Spin? Spin state transitions, high spin, low spin, intermediate spin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so on all these different, uh, you know, antiferromagnetic orders, of course, you may have at the same time intermediate high spin or low spin, and, and we did actually work on that quite a lot. So, in the particular case of so so so, so 
Yeah, so we check out all that uh, possibilities and we actually discuss it quite a lot in, in, in our uh, last paper in the supplementary information. So it's a bit controversial in bismuth cobaltite, so whether it's a high, intermediate, or low spin, so mm -hmm. we deal with all that, yeah? All right, thanks. <laughs> I, I have a question about uh, your face diagram. Uh, when you construct a phase diagram, I see you only have uh, single phase regions. Have you ever considered there this possibility that you may have uh, coexisting phase regions? Oh, okay, so in our, of course, uh, in reality, if, I guess you may have, because also this, this is phase over the transition, so of course you may have coexistence. In our calculations, we have to say, of course, we are considering single crystals and very smooth things, so in reality, uh, probably, yeah, that boundaries are not that uh, clear, right? So in our simulations, so answering to your question, we haven't considered coexistence between phases, but of course, that it's the most likely thing to, to, to probably observe in, in reality. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we can ask the next speaker in the meantime to get ready. And I think Roman had a question. Uh... Thank you very much for the presentation. A uh, strong enhancement of intensity when the system enters uh, the antiferromagnetic phase. But the intensity enhancement occurs at where the lattice mode uh, is dominant. Here, there's no spin wave intensity. But from the temperature dependence of the observation, it is reasonable to propose that this enhancement is actually related to what's happening in the magnetic channel. But it's hard to imagine how this magnetic excitation near Q equals pi can be uh, mapped to a mode near Q equals zero and interact directly with the phonon mode here. So what we think about this is if we think about the magnetic order, here is actually magnetic bright peak based on this cycloid order, and the polar order here they are actually connected, associated with each other based on this DM interaction. So if you have two orders that's coupled together, if one order, say here, the spin order, starts to fluctuate, creates spin wave excitations, it is natural to assume that some certain uh, excitation mode will also be coming out from the other order that's near Q, Q equals zero. So that's basically our idea of how this spin wave mode can be mapped to the lattice mode. And the details of that mapping, I'm just going to go briefly through this, uh, not really uh, trying to get an exact mass model, but this probably will help you understand how we think about this. So here, basically, that's the spin structure in BFO. Along one-on-one -on -one direction, you have spins being antiphase. Uh, along the perpendicular cycloid direction, O one bar one direction, the spins sort of rotate from the cycloid plane. And the spins and the polarizations, they are sort of coupled through this uh, DM interaction where SI cross SI plus one, and then the cross product of the connecting factor of them will give a positive polarization along one on one direction. And we can see easily if we do that for the second row, we always get another positive uh, polarization. Uh, on the, uh, so, so basically, this is mapping a antiphase spin structure, which corresponds to magnetic bright peak at Q equals pi, to an in-phase polar order, which corresponds to uh, the nuclear zone center Q equals zero. So similarly, if we consider spin wave excitations, well, for classic spin wave theory, the spin wave excitations are actually spins uh, precessing around the original uh, direction. But in our case, uh, we can just think about the in-plane uh, component because actually if you look at the out-plane component, they, their effect tends to cancel out. Okay. So if you look at the spin fluctuations, basically we can just put a simple model, put everything, the time dependence, of spin uh, vectors into this uh, formula, and then we get a time-dependent polarization. And this term actually comes uh, to be a static term, P0, which is the original term, plus a fluctuating term. And the fluctuating term, we can see, is actually a second-order effect. It only uh, comes from the two 
uh, spin fluctuation term. And if we think about the direction of this fluctuating term, we can see the top row, the direction of the fluctuating polar mode actually comes along the positive one-on-one -on -one direction. The bottom row, if we do this cross product, it actually also gives a positive one-on-one -on -one fluctuating term. So this is a simple scheme where one couples a antiphase spin fluctuation mode that appears near Q equals pi plus Q to a in-phase polar mode which appears near Q equals zero. So that's a simple phenomenological model that explains what happens, uh, how one can map a spin wave mode near Q equals pi to a lattice mode near Q equals zero uh, through a dynamic sort of DM interaction. So what happens here is if we have a spin wave mode near Q equals pi, that can be mapped to a mode which is shown by this dash line. This is supposed to be a pure lattice mode that's induced by the spin wave excitation near Q equals zero. So this mode, if we call it a magnetophonon mode, we try to measure it, we never see a entire melt like this near Q equals zero in our measurement because most likely it's a second order effect. However, if this melt, this dash line melt, which we can sort of see on paper but not in reality, if it crosses a real polar phonon melt, and if they have the similar eigenvectors, let's say, there could be an enhancement at the crossing point, which is what we saw as a resonance. So if we calculate uh, where the crossing point is based on the spin wave dispersion map being mapped near Q equals zero, the crossing point is at energy, of course, the optophonon energy, but at a small but finite Q, about 0 0.015 a reciprocal lattice unit. So this actually naturally answers our previous two questions. First is why do we see these modes on this uh, spin resonance only near 101 Brad peak. The reason is because our coupling between the uh, dynamic, between the spin fluctuation and the polar fluctuation is only strong when you couple to the 101 polarization. So you see that near 101 Brad peak, that's sensitive to uh, polarization fluctuation along 101 direction. The other question is why do Raman measurements not see this enhancement? because in our neutral measurement, we have a rather coarse uh, Q resolution. So when we measure near Q equals zero, it actually covers this small Q. But for Raman measurements, this Q is actually non-zero. So it's not observable by Raman measurements. So that's basically what we, uh, how we try to explain this. And the last uh, figure I want to show is a confirmation where we look at magnetic field effect. So basically, if this model is correct, under this picture, if we are able to affect the coupling between the spin, uh, cycloid spin structure and the polarization in any way, then it may also affect this uh, phonon resonance. We were able to uh, apply a big magnetic field, like 13 Tesla. And after this magnetic field is applied, uh, the spin structure, exact spin structure is not clearly known because it's hard to measure a single crystal uh, diffraction at this uh, high field. But what we know is there is a huge enhancement of polarization going along one-on-one -on -one direction when you apply a big field like this. So what happens here, if we measure this phonon uh, resonance under a big field, here is the magnetic bra peak, so show, showing that the magnetic structure has been affected by the field. Exactly what it is, we don't know for now. But if we measure phonons, this is measurement near 111, where the enhancement, where the uh, phonon resonance occurs, we can see that there's also a big enhancement of this resonance intensity with field. If we go away, slightly away, go to 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1 .1, we see that enhancement is not there. So basically, all these results suggest that we are really seeing a very interesting dynamic coupling between the magnetic uh, excitation and phonons. So the summary is here. We see an optic phonon intensity enhancement uh, near the zone center 
uh, measure 101 when the antiferromagnetic order is established. So this is due to a possible dynamic DM coupling of spin wave onto phonon mode, and also the resonance is further enhanced with large magnetic field when the ferroelectric electric polarization is also enhanced. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a nice story, experimental one. Yes. Hey, nice talk. Nice talk. Thank you. So at the beginning, you show some some plots of the phonon uh, vibrations, right, as a function of temperature. But uh, so you go quite high in temperature, so you go up to a hundred and Kelvin or so. Seven hundred. Yeah. yeah. Well, we couldn't go very high. Yeah. So th the, my point is so. Even at high temperature, you still just look into the low energy phonons. Why, why you do that? So I mean, oh. When, oh. When, when you have a large uh, n, uh, temperature, the phonons that becomes more important for, for, for the vibrational or, or, or thermodynamic properties of the systems are high, you know, high energy. So it's in, on those that probably you could see larger effects uh, from the magnetic uh, disorder. So if you look into the low energy phonons, even if you go high in temperature, you wouldn't see anything there, probably. But it's because they are not really coming into play. Yeah, you're right. There sure. are a number of reasons why we do that. Yeah. One is technical reason. It's hard to measure higher energy okay. phonons. Okay, okay. Second is, as I said, there are some motivations. One of the motivation of our study was this hybrid mode that okay. Raman people have seen. And those are at lower energies. Okay, okay. So That's partially it. we were looking for that. Uh -huh. And also another motivation was we were not really looking at, say, magnetoelastic coupling that affects overall phonon structure. We are looking at more, you know, okay. limited to certain regions. So a number of reasons why we didn't do that. It would be hard to do that with a small crystal. So in the future, that's one of our plan because if this model is correct, then we would possibly also see some effect at other locations at higher energy phonons. Okay, thank so, you. I see. Okay. Thank you. I have also a question. Did you try to calculate dynamical structure factor, the phonon intensity? Would it be uh, like contribution of the magnetic scattering in your experiment or just nuclear scattering for the oh. phonon? Uh, well, you, you mean just calculate the phonon? structure factor across. No, we didn't do that, but the, the reason we did not do that was because this enhancement, I, I just cannot find any reason that the enhancement would just come in at Q equals zero, but not somewhere away from that for that sort of mode, right? I mean, if it's a structure factor issue, normally you would expect at least big part of the branch intensity increase. So I didn't do that. And I, I, I truly believe this, this enhancement itself is purely nuclear. I mean, it's induced probably by magnetic scatter, scattering, but, but what we see is probably pure, purely nuclear. Okay. okay, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, <laughs> so in this multiferric session, we had a little bit of uh, very nice uh, theory, uh, Vinicius, which can give us finite temperatures. Then we had uh, real uh, uh, difficult experiments with you know, elastic Newton scattering uh, on bismuth ferrite. And now we are coming uh, with expert, which is actually knowing a lot about how to prepare uh, multiferroic materials. Of course, he's not to talking only about that, but uh, if uh, everything works well, We'll get the title, which is single phase and single ion displacive type manganese perovskite uh, multiferroics by uh, Professor Dabrowski uh, from Northern Illinois University. Okay, thank you very much on, t on this last talk in the session before the banquet. Uh, all right, so most of the things I want to talk were already mentioned in the session, except one thing that in my model, Phenomenological model, I have a very simple explanation for ferroelectricity, and I found so many expect exceptions for that today that I don't know. It's like learning French. There are so many rules and 100 times of more of exceptions from these rules. So, so this is the outline, okay? And my basic idea is that uh, ferroelectricity, at least in this simple 
barium titanate systems like this, which are shown in the phase diagram, is related to elongation of the B side perovskite bonds beyond the equilibrium values. Right, so we talk about a little bit about this distortion of perovskite versus tolerance factor, which is the parameter I'm using in all of that. And then in the barium titanate, control of ferroelectric transition temperature and hopefully increase by just simple substitution, like lead substitution, which is obviously increasing TF. And by TF, I mean ferroelectric transition temperature. All right, so then I say now reasons why there are so many so, so few ferroelectrics is but because tolerance factor around room temperature we need to achieve is very rare in perovskites. And then I will talk about this uh, simple strontium barium manganite, which were found to be multi dimensional material. System can escape from elongated bonds. Here's no way the three dimensional network has to, bonds have to be elongated. And there are other materials. Now, today was the talk about covalent materials. Now, the, I say these are not good for electricity for many reasons, because of this uh, mixed valency, high spin, low spin, but they show metallic properties mostly. So I don't know how you, how you achieve this ferroelectric materials with the cobalt. And there are problems with many others. This is why I'm saying there are so few true multiferroic, there's only one ion, like manganese. Right, so now the problem is that now we are making material which is perovskite, we have to start with tolerance factor smaller than one, and then because it's going down, to achieve it with tolerance factor larger than one, and this is the trick that we make it here, a high temperature, and then we reduce it such that we make hexagonal materials of this form, pull it down at the low temperature, we oxygenate them without decomposition in any case. The reason is when manganese three plus is much bigger than manganese four plus, and then hopefully with this oxygenation we achieve the range when the storage factor is much bigger than one. If it's just a little bit bigger, then we get the elongation of the bonds, and if it's smaller, we get these rotations of octahedra. All right? So this is the oxygenation. Now here I want to make a point because there is this uh, talk about that these materials are bad. All right? So here is the here is the thermographic measurements for the strontium manganese, for example, under oxygen conditions and low oxygen pressure and then hydrogen. Now, this is in the Celsius grade. I'm, I'm, I'm worrying about materials which are about 400 Kelvin, and then these conditions, in oxidizing conditions, these materials are perfectly stoichiometric in oxygen. There are other problems, like again, they may be leaky with respect to resistive materials, and as I showed, they have very large hysteretic behavior. So if you measure something in vacuum, you are done to, to, to fail because you remove oxygen, like here in example in the hydrogen. In the transition temperature, you will lose oxygen and the measurements will be irreproducible on top of the other things. But these materials are perfectly, perfectly fine with this respect, single phase and stoichiometric and oxygen. So samples are perfectly fine, but the measurements are the problem, like I don't want to cite Ronald Reagan, but the government is the problem. All right, so unfortunately, we're not the first to measure this, uh, find this uh, multiferroic behavior. Sakai, 2011, 2011, found them. And this is, again, just in a pure strontium barium system at very low temperature measurement of the, of the uh, hysteresis loop. Now, this was because materials are leaky with respect to resistive properties. But when they measure lattice, Constants, they see transition to ferroelectric state when diagonal structure develops, but then when anti transition happens, part of the distortion and sometimes very large part of distortion is going away or even may, may go completely down. Right? All right, so we attempted to make them also, and we are later we finally made them, even though we tried for many years earlier. We achieved only very small range of solubility just for pure strontium barium system. It's antiferromagnetic, completely not changing in the field. Structure is the same like barium titanate, except peaks are shifted because this is smaller. That uh, uh, is constant. All right, so here is the example of uh, X-ray experiment with heating for these three samples, and we see just gradual development of this transition temperature and suppression of transition at 
nail temperature. So X-ray diffraction indicates on average structure in the cubic. And this is the third time in my life when I found that X-ray is completely wrong. Here is the example of neutron diffraction experiment, which can find position of the oxygen. Right? So we have basically the same behavior when you look at the lattice constant and see the ratio as X-rays. But then if you look at the bond lengths, you see that it's cubic, now obviously bond lengths, and you can look for the in plane and, and axis bond lengths. They are going different in the ferroelectric region, but then they are also present with different magnitude in a, in a uh, multiparoic phase. The only thing is that the average is getting the same as if they were in the cubic structure. So the splitting into longer and shorter is basically the same. The different bigger is the same as different or smaller, like not like in a titanate. Right, so then we have all measurements for these uh, bond lengths, and then the dominant effect really from which you can estimate polarization, spontaneous polarization, very large, comes from the bond angle in a plane. So the bonds are basically adding up to the average, but they, because they are off of the plane, it's included as an angle in a neutron diffraction experiment. So large, was well, basically I'm going to conclude now. So bond splitting is still present. You see effect at antiferromagnetic transition temperature. But materials remain ferroelectric below this transition. All right, so it's an example of uh, magnetic measurement into diffraction. This is indeed G-type antiferromagnetic for all the substitutions, like in a, in a pure strontium manganese system. All right, so, uh, okay, I will stop here, so that will be left. Keeping the time, uh, I think... Uh, it's up to organizers to say, but we are closing to the uh, dinner. So, are there some urgent questions? Uh, seven. Okay. So, actually, uh, we can have questions, and if somebody's courage, he can ask about what is what was missing in the talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. A very urgent, quick question: Did you correct Wikipedia? <laughs> You highlighted some error in Wikipedia. Did you correct it? Did you actually no, correct it? No, I did <laughs> I think maybe we have time, so you can tell us maybe a few things uh, with the permission of organizers about the okay. red, no, no rectangular. No All right, so I quickly went through, through this region here. Now, actually, development was completely different, but for pedagogical leading, uh, reasons, I started here. Now, these were the first things we found, and then we found this titanium substitute in materials. Right, so now we are going back. Here we substitute manganese for titanium. Now we substitute titanium for manganese in this system. Right, so here are the, all the samples we made uh, with respect, respect to, to barium content and with respect to titanium content. And here we don't have neutron diffraction experiment. We have only X-ray experiments as a function of temperature. Now this is in the case data for the splitting uh, of the C over A ratio at room temperature. I remind you that this is 1.11 for the barium titanate. Now here we get much bigger values. There is a range we try to look carefully. And then because of the difficulty with the synthesis, now we do not see coherent development ferroic behavior, but clearly there is ferroelectric phase. All of these materials are also magnetic, but as you put titanum or manganese, you are diluting magnetic network, so antiferroic transition is going down while ferroelectric transition is going up. You speak to the microphone? Okay. <laughs> and then I cannot see. <laughs> so. All right, so here is an example of... Uh, of uh, one of them, so whatever this particular value of strontium, barium, and manganese titanium doesn't matter, all of them behave similarly, and you see increase of uh, ferroelectric transition temperature above that what is seen in barium titanate. This is an example of the heating, so we cool it down and heat it up, and then in this case we have very large steel uh, distortion uh, of, of the C-axis, even in a Antiferroelectric phase. 
and then we have all the measurements measuring uh, antiferritin transition temperature. Now, so in the X-ray, we see both easily ferroelectric antiferromagnetic transition temperature, and then we have this X-ray kind of suppression of displacive distortion at Tn. All right, so with this substitution on a one site, now we can control the competition between coupling, between ferroelectric and magnetic orders, and then increase Tf or decrease Tn, and then how much is suppressed. So then we have different uh, regions of uh, antiferromagnetic and, and uh, ferroelectric behavior. All right, so here is an example of several more of X-ray diffraction experiments with many different samples, but I want to point out this situation here with these compositions, for example, which we measured, managed to measure both on heating and cooling, and I just want to emphasize this point, that here, in this case, the cubic here is just cubic to tetragonal and then back to tetragonal or, or cubic at a low temperature, so there are no free transitions. But this humongous hysteresis of this transition, which is now 45, it goes to up to 50 Kelvin. So this is the problem with the measurement, because now if you, if you try to measure this material and you measure it to too high temperature, you remove some oxygen from the sample. Very leaky behavior. And then on top of that, this humongous hysteresis. So, we do not have complete, except for the X-ray and neutron diffraction experiment, uh, experiments, proof that they are ferroelectric. Right. So, all right. So, as last thing, then good enough Kanamori rules, which I use for the magnetic interactions, predict that if I manage to make this angle much smaller than the one we achieved, we should go to ferromagnetic regime. So that will be the guide to have much larger bond splitting and much larger distortions of this titanium in, a, in this uh, unit cell to go into ferromagnetic because I actually would like to have ferromagnetic and ferroelectric. And as I pointed out, I'm from magnetic area, so TC for me is ferromagnetic transition temperature and TF is ferroelectric transition temperature. Okay, with that, uh, let me thank you again <laughs> and uh, let's thank all the speakers. <laughs> Do you have an announcement from, for the dinner? We have, uh, we have a banquet now uh, till 9 o'clock. We've actually, I, I hate to say this, but uh, uh, we, we actually uh, have budgeted, uh, even though we don't have like drink coupons, like one uh, drink per person. But uh, if you have two, that's fine. But uh, just keep that in mind. So uh, thank you. I don't know. I always this guy be, be, before me spoke like for 40 minutes.